but, but, but I can get a higher rate of return. Today, we're going to be talking about one of the biggest misconceptions there is with the infinite banking concept. So stick around. Enjoy the episode. Enjoy it more. If you're an investor or want to be an investor and you're looking to create passive income that exceeds your monthly expenses, then this is the podcast for you. Here on the Infinite Wealth Podcast, we combine the philosophies of Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad, along with Nelson Nash's Infinite Banking Concept. Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast. I'm Cameron Christensen, along with our co-host, Anthony Faso. He's a recovering CPA, for those of you that are just <laughs> tuning in. Uh, today, we are continuing our journey through Nelson Nash's Becoming Your Own Banker, and we're in one of the most tightly contested mm. sections of the book, or most referenced, I would say as well uh we're going to be talking about the cost of acquisition and also the section in which he addresses but i can get a higher rate of return and anthony i've said this before but today i really yeah. mean it you're excited about this one i am i would say that page 69 but i can get a higher rate of return is my actual favorite page mm. it was one of the biggest obstacles that i had personally and it's one that is commonly misunderstood. So I'm looking forward to being able to explain what Nelson's talking about, that it's not about the rate of return. It's about the volume, but let me not get too into it now. Mm. Okay. Mm. Let's take our time because we first got to go to page 68 as we're continuing through the path of becoming your own banker. And Cam, we're, we're kind of getting towards the end, man. I know. I, was, I know. We are getting towards the end, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm excited because uh, this would be one of many times that I've finished the book before you, mm. so I am a few pages ahead of you, but cost of acquisition. Anthony, as you were going through the cost of acquisition, what were some thoughts? What were some takeaways that you had from this section? Before we get into it, Cameron, let me just explain a little bit of what he's talking about on what is the cost of acquisition, and he starts with telling us two stories. One is a story of a hammer. Right. And the cost of the hammer was $17. Mm -hmm. However, when you take into account all the people that had to be part of that process from figuring out to buy it, then actually buying it, then maintaining it, when you, when you account for their time, that added another $100. So the point is, it's more than just the cost of the item. We also have to talk about what it takes to to not only buy that or get that item, but to also maintain it. Then he also talks about a story where Lee Iacocca, when he took over Chrysler, they were in uh, financial dire straits and they found the only way out was to get a loan from the government. So they went and did this whole big presentation to get a loan from the government. They didn't get a loan from the government, but they got the backing of a loan from the government. Mm -hmm. So then the next step was now they had to go to a bank to find somebody that would th that that would finance it but then also once they found that there was also additional uh things that they needed to do to maintain uh the good standing in regards to the bank so all the expenses were more well, much more than the interest but also the time involved because also one thing he's talking about typically when you get a loan like a lot of our clients if you get a car loan or a mortgage, right? There's things what's, what's, which we call debt covenants. Mm. Now, what that means is there's some requirements in there that you need to maintain or to do to, uh, to keep that loan. Now, if we relate it to a car, very common that you need to maintain insurance, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, and also maybe if you have a, a mortgage that you can't change the title. Like with a lot of investors are probably buying a home in their personal name, but then they want to transfer it to the LLC. And that can be a, a, a violation of the note, which means if you're in violation of the note, the bank can change the terms, mm -hmm. which means uh, they could raise the rates or they could even call the loan. Uh, but he's talking about all these additional things that are in addition to just getting the loan. But let, let me just be clear that now, depending if you got your loan from Fannie Mae or, or Freddie Mac, they are allowing you to transfer it into an LLC as long as it, it is it is the same owner. But again, there are some steps to do that. So the bottom line, what he's discussing 
is that we need that there's more than the interest. We need to f- acquire the loan and also maintain the loan. And so, uh, but how does that relate to infinite banking, right? Th- getting a policy loan will be the easiest loan you've ever gotten. Why do you say that? Well, I say that because there's no, pre- you're already qualified. You are already approved and it's not reported on your credit. There is no a set repayment schedule. It's, it's, it's uh, a very simple interest only, interest only line of credit. And ideally we encourage people to, to pay the interest. But again, this is so flexible, you don't have to, right? And if you don't, they will add it to the loan, which ideally we don't want, but it is nice to have that, nice to have that flexibility. Mm-hmm. And let me just throw in a little, little story oh, here. Please do. Uh, you're welcome. I had a, a client who was going to buy an, a, a rental property. He was self-employed. So as, if you've gone through that, it can be very difficult to explain that to the underwriter and maybe you're writing off some expenses that maybe aren't exactly business expenses or you have depreciation. So the net income looks really smaller than than it is, but he was focused on growing his business, not trying to pacify this underwriter who continued to ask for more and more information. And then as he was complaining to me, um, I said, you know what? You also, you have enough money in your policy. So if you want, you can just take a policy loan and don't have to worry about the mortgage. And he did that. And not then again, he, uh, he didn't have to go through all of those hoops, but was also interesting. Some of his expenses were lower because he didn't need some, the bank had required some additional expenses, one being an a, uh, appraisal, but he was comfortable with the value. Even if it under it was appraised under value, he was going to pay the difference. So he was able to save that uh, cost and along with some other ones, but then now he was in control of, of, of the loan and the terms and didn't have to worry about pacifying, uh, pacifying the bank. Cam, any? Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if you're going to throw it to me. Uh, Eventually I will <laughs> you know, when I'm done. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well said, man. Those are gr- great examples. Uh, would add on there. Uh, there's a couple things that came to my mind as I was going through this section. One, the first one is he talks about the cost of acquisition for me. What that means is that time is money. That's the way that I took it to interpret it. Mm-hmm. And then the second thing thought that I had as I was going through this, number one is this, is that this is, uh, uh, years ago I came across this example. Um, but what it talked about is the, uh, like the cost of savings, like what it actually looks like to have $20 in your possession to spend or to save. And so for someone to come up with $20 is most people will think, hey, if I'm making $20 an hour, that's one hour of work. But in reality, that's not how you end up with $20 in your hand to spend, right? For really for someone to end up with $20 of discretionary income is you've got to work maybe a hundred hours, or you've got to go earn a hundred dollars. And if you're saving 20% of that, now you have $20 of discretionary income. And so you take that hour, those dollars, and you translate that into hours. If you work four hours at $25 an hour, now you've got about $20 of discretionary income to spend in your pocket. And, or you can extend that example any way you want. And so the first time I read or heard about that example, it was really mostly about savings. But mm-hmm. in this example, I thought it lined up really well is because most people only think about that end result. They don't think about all the time and effort that it takes to actually get to that end result. And in this example, what he's talking about is the acquisition of money or loans from a government entity. But it's the same thing when it comes to just dollars that you have to spend or invest at the end of the day is there's a whole lot of time and energy that is spent building up or creating value to, for you to end up with $20 in your pocket to be able to go and invest and or spend. So I thought that was a great example that kind of lined up well with it. Cameron, I, that that was a really good analogy. I, I like that. Oh, thanks, Faso. You're welcome. Uh, there's a question in there that you had asked, and it says, how does this kind of relate to infinite banking? Mm-hmm. 
and you had mentioned it, but I'm going to echo it is when infinite banking, there is no asking right? For money is <laughs> you're not going and asking anybody what you're doing up is you're doing is you're calling up the insurance company and you're telling them two things. You're telling them how much money you want and where you wanted it, want it deposited. And that's it. And so that's the control and freedom that you have that Nelson is addressing in this section. So I hope that helps. Yeah. Well done. Thanks. All right, Anthony, let's move on. Uh, let's move on to your favorite section, but, but I can get a higher rate of return. Uh, I know you've got several takeaways. I'm sure you could give a whole class on this section. <laughs> But Anthony, give us some highlights here. Give us some highlights. I would say what why I like this the most is that this was one of the the biggest obstacles that that I had to personally overcome when I first. I remember when I <laughs> good one when I first read the book. What I had done is like it sounded too good to be true, mm -hmm. right? So fortunately or unfortunately i had relationships with a lot of typical financial planners and i would go to them and ask them why this would not work and i think we've done some we've done a video on kind of some, some of those myths and and misunderstandings but one that i remember like i remember on the phone call because then i had to tell my financial planner like what i was doing like mm -hmm. you've been a good friend but i'm move i'm moving all of my money and when I told him we were look, uh, looking at putting into whole life, I, I, I really wish I could have seen his face, right? But um, he was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We would never recommend that. Mm. You know, I can earn you such a higher rate of return. And and then I went back. I was like, you know, tried to, to the guy who had first explained this to me. is like, well. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Um <laughs> But I can earn a higher, but this guy can earn me a higher rate of return. And that's when I realized that infinite banking is not about the rate of return of an investment. Infinite banking is how you finance those investments. Because the key thing and you often hear us say, this isn't an either or. We're not saying put your money in life insurance or put it into real estate or your business or whatever your asset of choice is, that this is an and asset. That you can put your money in the policy and invest in your business and invest into, into real estate. And so that, that was really eye-opening to me. And that's really, because really what it comes down to is if you're going to buy a house or this investment, you have to store that capital somewhere. So the question is, what is the best place to store it? Most people are going to use either a checking account or a savings account. The downside is once you deploy that money, Cameron, how much are we earning in that bank account when it's zero? Zero. Right, it's zero. But what if we store that same amount of money inside a policy, and instead of taking a withdrawal, we took a loan against it and bought an asset? How much is our cash value growing? A lot, 4%. It's growing the same as whether you left it in there or not, right? So we're never breaking the compound interest curve, right? And another thing I want to, or did you want it to say something? No. Okay, sure. Just stay, uh, here. stay here and look good. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry. You know, it, it, well, one thing I want to reiterate is that your policy is not an investment. Great point. Right. The investment is what we what we leverage against the policy to invest in. So. What that means, if it's not an investment, we can't evaluate it as a, as a microscope as we would with an investment. Because an investment, we put money in the investment and we expect some sort of return. Mm -hmm. Now, but also that investment could actually go down. The policy is different. For one, it's going to go up every year. But also, and we're very open, there is that slow start the first couple of years. So you put in a dollar and you don't have access to that full dollar. And if we're just evaluating it as an investment on that short period, it's going to look terrible. However, this is not an investment. Your money is going to go up every year. And what we really need to do is evaluate what we do, not just how the policy performs, but what we can, what we can purchase with investments by leveraging that policy. We really need to look at, at both. And really some of the things about infinite banking, what I, what I think some of the great things is that people are finally in control of their money, which means not only do they make the decisions, 
but also they can reap the rewards now as opposed to waiting until they're in their 60s. You know, and, and a couple examples that we have shared with one of our clients when we first asked them, we got when we got on a discovery call, we always ask them, what are some of your goals? What are some things you're trying to accomplish? The number one thing he said is I want to be able to tell my wife she doesn't have to go to work tomorrow. Now, before he had all of his money inside his 401k, but when we were able to free it up and he was able to invest in himself and he got into some short-term rentals, he started creating passive income that allowed him to be able to tell his wife that 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 that, that she did that she didn't work. And also one of one of the great stories is you know we have uh, many clients flipping land and there was there was one we've in, in, interviewed him on our podcast before where he actually was a, flipped some land he came out of pocket for a dollar 98 and he was able to get a bank loan for the rest ended up netting a million bucks now th- that isn't all ibc <laughs> Okay. Do, do not get me wrong, but what this, but by practicing IBC and you, him being in control of his money, as opposed to being locked up in his 401k in a mutual fund allowed him to be able to take advantage of these opportunities. So those are a couple of highlights I had about higher rate of return. Do you have anything to add cam or are we done? No, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> not funny. Uh, we got uh, two things one, uh, that you said. One is that uh, people are now in control of their money. And this is exactly what this section is talking about on page 70. What Nelson's doing on this graph here is he's showing again how when this individual takes control of the financing function of his logging company, takes back more control, he ends up with more money at the end of the day. So that's what I'm going to go through briefly with you guys. And then also the second point that you made is that the cash values are going up every single year. And so that's also what's being highlighted here on page 70. I remember page 70 uh, when we first started doing kind of infinite banking and book reviews, Mm -hmm. uh, right? Man, page 70 was like, it's it, man. Like this is the most important book in a most important page in this book. And so if you can understand this, you're going to be all right. And so I want to go through this with you quickly on page 70. So that way, if you guys are at home, you guys know kind of where some of these numbers are coming from. So what's happening here on page 70 is Nelson previously has done a couple of illustrations. One he did uh, on page 54, uh, he calls illustration one, which is kind of the do nothing example where the, cl- where the individual just funds it for four years and then stops and just lets it run out. The next example that he does on page 59, illustration two, is when he actually puts some money in and then he starts financing one vehicle. In the first box on page 70, uh, if you guys don't have uh, this page, we'll maybe share a PDF in the show notes. But in the uh, on page 70, in this first box, what he's talking about is he's comparing the cash values from the do-nothing example to the financing uh, of one truck example. And so there's a difference in outlay that's uh, that's shown on page uh, 70, and this is where this 19,400 comes from. Is the truck payments are 18,000 a year for four years? 18 times four is 72,000. 72,000 minus 52,600, which is the cost of the truck, and we know that from a couple pages before on that promissory note. The difference between that 72,000 and the 526 is how much an interest he would have paid. And so what Nelson is showing us here in this first uh, section uh, from years four to eight is that he borrowed some money out. He The difference in what he put back was 19400 but the policy increased in cash value from uh, by 14796 And the way that he got that was just taking the cash value increase from line eight on page 54 for, uh, and line eight on page 59. So he put in 19,400 and the policy increased by 14,796. That's what he's shown in the first example. That 19,400 is also shown in the next two examples because he's financing the same truck just over and over again. So that doesn't change. But what's important in the second box is that he's comparing, again, the do nothing illustration that shows him just putting money and leaving it there versus the illustration two where he's financing two trucks and now the difference between 
what was put in, the difference in outlay versus what was gained. Difference in outlay is still the same, 19400 but the difference in gain is now 20596 which means that the policy grew by more than what he put into mm -hmm. it. And so that example just continues to extend, and that's what he does in that third box. I won't continue to belabor you guys with the numbers because it's a podcast, but the takeaway that you guys want to have after reading page 70 is, again, the more that you use this, the better that it gets. And that's probably the toughest uh, lesson for people to learn is because very few instruments or uh, vehicles, financial tools are that way, right? If you go and you use something like your car insurance, if you file a claim, it's going to get jacked up, right? It doesn't work in your benefit most of the time. And this is different than uh, pretty much every other thing because of that right there. Well done, Cam. And, and what I noticed with that, that first, um, the first time we had bought in a truck, you know, they had put in 19, but they, they, got, they grew by about 75% of what they put in. An important thing to remember, if somebody wasn't using IBC and they were just using the cash, they were still going to deploy that 19 grand, but they, they, would have, they would have zero gain. And I, I do want, I want to say two comments on this. It's okay if you don't get this part, right? Cause this part, this part is, I tell you, I've had a hard time with it through the years, but uh, also what well, Cameron, we don't quite have the technology just to throw a PDF in, in the show notes. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, which is why I giggled when you said it, but we'll put a link, we'll put a link. Yeah. If you want it, email us. Okay the the link will will the link for that will be in the show notes. You know what's also going to be in the show notes? A link to get on a discovery call, mm -hmm. right? So if you really want to kind of learn more about page uh, seventy, well, we're put you on on Cameron's calendar and he can explain it. But really, if you want to learn about IBC, the first step is really to kind of learn about it to see if it's a good fit for you. And I think the best step is to get on, get on a discovery call with us. Well said, Anthony. Guys, today we covered uh, the cost of acquisition, right? Time is money. And then we also discussed, but I can get a higher rate of return. Again, the comment that Anthony made, I think, is IBC is not about rate of return on investment. IBC is about how you finance your investments. And that's probably the smartest thing I've ever heard him say. Mm, wow. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Hope you guys enjoy this episode. Go make it a fantastic day. Take care. If you like this video, I know you like this one. And if you want to learn how investors use infinite banking to increase their returns and lower their taxes, check this out. And if you want to, if you have some questions and want to see if infinite banking is for you, hop on a discovery call with us. Link for that will be in the description.